Um, so I'm based here in Queensland, in Brisbane today, um, and I've worked for some fairly complex uh, organisations from government as well as the private sector. And along my journey, um, I've learned quite a bit of stuff, done things the hard way, uh, learned from my mistakes, and uh, hence why I'm here to share my journey with you. So today, I'm hoping that you will learn something from me um, and can share it with others as well. So in today's presentation, we're going to get some definitions uh, done first so that we all understand the context of this presentation and the key messages that I'd like you to take away at the end of the presentation. Because our presentation today is about how do we integrate customer journey maps and business architecture, the whole point is to actually help you understand that when we talk about the business, uh, we're actually talking about two different parts of the business. One is what we call the inside out view and the other is what we call the outside in view. So we're going to talk about then what's on this front stage, which is our outside in view. And then we're gonna talk about what's in our backstage, which is our inside out view. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about how do you actually bring these two worlds together through our integrated modeling and the work that we do as enterprise and business architects. I'll also talk to you about what are some of the things that you absolutely should do when you are establishing an, an enterprise architecture practice. And more importantly, when you try to integrate the models that you create through uh, service design and even customer journey mapping, and how do you build capabilities so that your business architects can learn how to fit in and integrate with these models and how they uh, are used then to create the models that help us describe our inside out view. I'm also going to talk to you about what are the landmines that you're going to find along the way? Uh, what are some of the things that you shouldn't do? Um, and um, we'll also be in that discussion looking at what are the things that perhaps you should be doing instead. I'll then have a quick summary at the end and then we'll open it up for question and answers and hopefully have a little bit of a discussion uh, through our Q&A uh, around what you have learned today. Okay, so we're up to getting some definitions done first then. Um, and here we're going to talk about service design because customer journey maps are a very large part of your service design modeling. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about what is business architecture then. And we're actually going to look at some definitions uh, that are publicly available on other people's point of view in terms of what is business architecture. So I'm a really big fan of the IDO people. Um, so if you have seen any of their material, which comes from the University of Stanford, um, service design is the craft of tying together. And here I'm going to emphasize tying together human, digital and physical interactions over time to create a truly differentiated experience for your customers. So I challenge you now to think about a number of your projects that you might be doing now that fall under the umbrella of service design and ask yourself whether what you're doing is only digital um, and perhaps what you're doing hasn't really considered the human or the physical interactions people are having with the solutions that you're providing. I'm also going to ask you to challenge yourselves in, in looking across your portfolios and thinking about the work that you're doing and how is it truly differentiating the experience for your customers. So service design is something that needs to be looked at end to end and much more holistically and comprehensively beyond the technology that you might deal with as an IT person within your organization. Um, business architecture, uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have seen these definitions uh, before. I'll start off with a definition from uh, a consulting company who I admire quite a lot. Their definition is really simple. It's very model driven um, as well. So for them, a business architecture is something that's structured and model driven to build and manage an organization. So we use the models to help us build 
and manage an organization. The Object Management Group and the Business Architecture Guild, or should I say the Business Architecture Guild, use the Object Management Group's definition of business architecture, where it is seen to be a blueprint of the enterprise that provides a common understanding of the organization. And it is used to align strategic objectives and tactical demands. So in my day-to-day -day work, this is pretty much what I do as an enterprise architect, as well as a business architect. We're constantly creating blueprints of our organization just so that we can get everybody on the same page in terms of how do we best deliver our, strate our strategic objectives and align the rest of the organization to do this in the best way. The third definition, which is from the open group. Uh, so for those of you who are TOGAP certified as I am, Business architecture is a description of the structure and the interaction between the business strategy, organization, functions, business processes, and information needs. For some of you who may have uh, come across some of my writing as well as uh, been at any other presentations I might have delivered, I quite often talk about enterprise architecture and business architecture being a people-oriented business. And this third definition basically um, says to me that we must always remember that our role as enterprise and business architects is to describe structure and interaction and to help the rest of the business use these descriptions when we draw our models to show how things are interrelated within the organization so that we may achieve our business outcomes and our business strategies a lot more effectively. So now that we've got those definitions out of the way, let's have a look at what service designers look at. So remember, these are the people that quite often look at the organization from the outside in. Um, so we're always looking at who are our customers? What do they think? What do they know? What do they feel? Uh, we're always very interested in the deep understanding of customers and what makes them happy. But what business architects then look at is things within the organization. So remember, this is the outside in view. How do we assemble the things that we need in order to provide the best customer service to our customers so that they are happy? So if you haven't achieved how to integrate the service design or this inside out view or this uh, with the business architecture views, which again is your outside in view, um, it's really important you listen to uh, what I'm going to cover in the session because it's not hard to achieve that seam seamless integration. And don't you think it's a, going to be a great idea to have both these views help you make better decision, decisions about the future um, design of your business? So let's have a look at what are the typical models that um, our service designers or customer experience uh, designers uh, play with and model with. So you can create all of these models using your Abacus solution. So a very popular model is the customer journey map. And over here, you can see that people are using emoticons. We're using uh, swim lanes and pools to show your customer journey, what are the steps in the journey and are these steps ideal or not, signified by a lot of happy faces and sad faces. So it's a really good way of pinpointing what's actually delivering a great experience to your customers and what's not. And therefore giving you the insights to help you prioritize and work out what should I improve first in terms of being able to give my customers a delightful experience. Service blueprints is another type of model used quite often by experienced designers. So again, they're very important in terms of looking at, you know, what channels are we providing our services through? We can do a lot of overlays when we create these models by showing which channels actually have the most amount of traffic coming through them which channels actually create really bad experiences for our customers and which ones are creating great experiences for our customers. And by knowing how our customers are interacting with us, we can then design our service blueprints 
for the future to make sure that every time we deliver a service through a channel, that's going to end up with a, an optimal result, which in my words is a wow. Another very simple tool to use to help you understand your customers, and, and I'm hoping some of you have uh, used persona profiles before, in a lot of the work that I have done, uh, we call a lot of this work user research um, and getting to intimately know our customers is a key objective of the work that we do. So again, knowing your various personas and how they want to interact with you and your organization is really important when it comes to designing great outcomes for these customers. So now let's look at what type of models are on the backstage. So I can tell you that I've spent most of my career doing a lot of backstage modeling. Now, what we've got to remember when we do modeling of what's inside our organization, that we don't give our consumers of these models map shock. So remembering to pick the models that we use on the backstage to appropriately reflect the insights that we're trying to deliver so that people can make great decisions about how do I now transform the inside and the guts of my organization so that I am aligned to delivering the customer wow. So I'm going to show you how you can do that in terms of capability model, in terms of capability modeling. So use your capability models as heat maps. So over here on this uh, example, you've got different colors. So we all know if a capability is green, it's going well. Don't go spending more money on making it more green because it may not be required. But there are some capabilities in your organizations that are bright red and are causing the, um, the pain points that your customers are having today. So you might want to look at them and do a deep dive on them to prioritize improving them so that you take away that customer's pain. So similarly with your application um, architectures and your application integration uh, diagrams, you can use heat maps um, very effectively to identify which systems and which solutions in your landscape are contributing to the pain that your customers are feeling. So obviously when systems are outdated, they're slow to respond, uh, the quality of the data is just rubbish, you know that they are key contributors to pain because they are marked as red. So you've got to work out what do you need to do to take away that red and turn it into either amber or green so that you have a better chance of contributing to a great customer experience. So similarly, don't throw your entity relationship models out because again, this leads us to where in the organization is data a problem? Are we capturing the right data to help us understand what's required to deliver great customer outcomes? And then process models. We've been process modeling for donkey's years. And again, similarly, you can use heat maps at any point in your process model to show what the source of pain is to a customer's experience. And I'm going to take you into a little bit more detail in this particular process model to show you where we actually can very clearly show how to improve customer experience and by how much. So the last model on here is an organization chart. We've been drawing them for years. So again, you can use heat map very effectively to identify in which parts of the organization do you not have the appropriate skill sets or the right talent to be able to deliver the right outcomes for your customers. So again, together, all these models that are on our backstage can help us design and deliver and support great customer journeys and customer outcomes. So now let's look at how do we integrate the front um, of our business with the back of our business. So in, again, I'm going to talk about the models that you would use to integrate your front and your back end. So again, any one of these boxes that you see on the screen now 
RA type of model in your architecture repository. So if you have a good healthy repository and you have all the relationships between your uh, repository objects defined well, you will identify these various topic areas. You will have user journey maps, you will have persona profiles, you will have registers and matrices of customer uh, needs in terms of what do they like, what do they say, what do they think, what do they feel. You will have identified all your channels uh, through which your customers uh, receive a service. So everything that you see in green on the right hand side of the screen are models of your front stage. So on your backstage, you have your capability models, which we looked at before, your organization charts, your information models, your value streams, your uh, business motivation model in terms of your vision, goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. You'll have your product catalog, service catalog, and so on and so forth. But where we need to bring this together is through your value streams and your product and services catalog. So what we have over here is on the under simple and easy, if we want to deliver simple and easy outcomes for our customers, it's important to know which value streams contribute to simple and easy. If we want to deliver services anywhere, anytime on any device, well, it's really important that you have a deep understanding of customer personas or end user personas if you're doing employee experience management understand their journeys and understand their emotions and record some information that tells you about how your customers think, feel, say, and do. Additionally, while you might have your product and service catalog on your backstage, it's really important to know how these contribute to your service definitions and design, which are really modeled in your service blueprint and to also understand how this helps support your brand and positioning within your organization. Now, this then becomes a very interesting way of looking at your business architecture and service design together. So in terms of our customer experiences and how do we deliver this wow to our customers, it's important to map out your customer's journey and understand what the story is at each step in this customer's journey. And then what we do next is to define what are the services that we are offering to our customers through each of these steps. And when we look down further and integrate that with our business architecture, so remember that the first two layers quite often are what we see on the front stage. The service layer is also what we see on the backstage um, in our organization. And that service layer is what's connecting us to our business architecture. So therefore, we understand in our business architecture the value streams required to deliver these services. And it's important for us to understand that these value streams are actually made up of the orchestration of capabilities to deliver value um, at the end of the day. So in this model, you can see that we have multiple capabilities delivering value stream A and capabilities being reused by other value streams to deliver value as well. This is a really important concept to get your head around in terms of how can I optimize and improve capabilities so that if I have a small step change improvement in one capability, it actually has a much broader impact and allows me to deliver more value to my customers, which translates into greater services. So within a capability, um, and, and to just very briefly define a capability here, a capability is made up of the people in your organization, your processes, the information and data that you use, as well as the technology and the tools used to deliver the capability outcomes effectively. So quite often in our world of modeling, we describe these as either scenario models or use cases. So in this case, I've called them use cases. Your use case should capture who is responsible or accountable for delivering this capability. 
what's the process? What data do you need? What are your inputs? What are your outputs? And then what are the tools that you're going to use to execute these or automate these processes? So again, when you have all these building blocks laid out in your architecture uh, repository, you know that by integrating each of these building blocks, you have now connected business architecture and your service design. So again, many years ago, I did a course um, on business process management and became certified uh, in business process management. One of the things I learned, and, and I'm talking about close to about 15 years ago when business process management was the thing to learn and be known for. One of the things I learned was uh, this concept that was called a moment of truth. And the definition you know, just fascinated me. A moment of true truth is defined as the point in time where you have the highest potential to either delight a customer or to totally uh, disappoint them at the point of where you could potentially lose them. Or in some cases, you will lose them because of the bad service or bad experience that they received. So 15 years ago, we didn't call it um, customer experience management. So when customer experience management started rearing its head, a lot of people were spending a lot of time uh, in UX and UI and designing these beautiful interfaces in the hope that they would be so beautiful and so intuit intuitive for customers to use that they would forget about the bad process that was sitting behind the interfaces. So over here, I'm going to challenge you to go back and look at your business process uh, models. Because if you're using a tool or a notation like BPMN, your customer interaction points are very clearly defined on these models. And over here, I have shown them as um, in between your customer uh, pool and your organization's pool. So that white space that is in between your organization and your customer is what we call the front stage and the backstage. And why is it important? Because it's at your customer interaction layer that you should be looking to develop your customer journey maps. And where I put little love hearts along this model, in BPMN, we call these little arrows message flows. These are your moments of truth. And in customer experience land, we now call these moments that matter, and rightly so. Each point is a point that you need to be invested in and to do your user research or your customer research to make sure you understand your customers' needs, wants, what they think, what they say, what they feel in every time they interact with your organization. So remember every message flow on your BPMN model is your interaction with your customer between your backstage and your front stage. So now let's look at um, some advice, some of the things that I've learned along the way. When you're trying to establish a business architecture practice, and at the same time, you have any number of customer experience uh, or user experience projects on the go as well, Quite often you find that these teams are working in silos, they're not working together. To be successful, you need to work out what capabilities do I need in order to integrate and work much better with the people who are in customer experience land, as well as your business architects. The first thing you need is an overarching framework. Uh, so this framework that I have up here I've modified from some Gartner research. This framework combines the various disciplines that are operating in your organization today to deliver customer outcomes. It incorporates the human-centered design approach to problem solving and solution provisioning. So in the first segment of this framework, you will see that all the activities are about understanding what's the problem about? And that's why it's called looking 
and understanding. It is only when we understand the root cause problem that we're trying to solve in the business can we go about thinking about solution. The challenge in a lot of organizations today is that we always lead with solution rather than trying to understand the problem first. So the next step after you've understood the problem well is to create rapid prototypes. So again, quite often in IT uh, organizations I've worked for, I see the solution delivery teams groan when I say, we've got to create some prototypes, guys. Now these prototypes don't need to take a lot of time. I've created prototypes in my time in minutes. If you go to the IDO website, they'll show you any number of techniques to create what we call two-dimensional prototypes. They're pencil sketches, they're napkin sketches that you can very quickly create and draw. And I'm not the best artist in the world, mind you, but I still managed to create enough information to be able to give the team an idea of what the solution might be. And once we've settled on a, a couple, maybe two or three um, potential ideas or concepts, we then do an assessment around their desirability, viability, and feasibility. Now, the desirability is how much does a customer want this, or how much does an end user actually desire the solution? We then look at the financial viability of it. And the financial viability really is all about your business case, right? What's the ROI? What's the NPV? Feasibility then looks at, do we have the ability to do this with the resources that we have? And that might be people, knowledge, skill sets. Uh, it could be tool sets as well. So when we look at all three of these together in terms of desirability, viability, and feasibility, and when they tick all the boxes, that's when you are ready to deliver the wow to the organization. And it is only at that point in time that you should get sign off from your sponsor and then move into your uh, making product or service and what I call the solutioning phase. Now, a lot of organizations stop when they deliver the solution. They have a product, they launch it into production and hope that people are going to love it because you've spent so much time and effort designing it and you've given it this U-Butte interface as well. But the problem is a lot of organizations don't invest in what, in what I call change enablement. So this is the golden area that if you do well, and if you adopt a change management framework like ProSci, you will make the new solution stick. You will actually help people learn how to use the tool and change the way they work so that you can deliver the benefits to the organization that you promised them. Now, in order to implement a framework like that, it's really important that you think about hiring these types of people, service designers, people that don't only look at UX and UI design, but are looking at the end-to-end -end customer journey and what's the best way to deliver the wow. You need business designers. In our world, we call them business architects. The business architects who focus on identifying problems, not solutions. They want to work with customers and the business to work out how do we design the optimal organization and the optimal value streams to deliver to our customers. You must also have change enablers. So quite often projects get shortchanged and when you're in a rush, you're under your over budget and your overtime, the place that a lot of people cut off projects is the embedding and the change enablement. So hire people who are passionate about helping end users and customers embrace and adopt and change the way they work by explaining to them why they need to work differently and how your new tool is gonna to help them do that. Hire IT enablers. So again, in the IT organization, a lot of IT organizations I've worked in, 
tend to have teams set up to function as silos. What you need to do is break these silos down and have people who passionately believe that they are actually part of the business and they're part of a broader multidisciplinary team and that we all own up the business problems together and therefore we will deliver the solutions together. And that means working in partnership with the business and not just being order takers. Hire passionate leaders as well. So don't reward people who are just in your organization to deliver short time or the quick wins. The quick wins are not cost effective in the long term. And therefore you need to have passionate leaders who believe in the rewards that will come in the long term while continuing to be agile and adaptive in the meantime and in the present. So get rid of these things. So some of you might uh, get a heart attack where, uh, when I start off by saying, stop thinking that Agile, and if you're using Safe or Scrum, will help you deliver outcomes faster. That's not gonna happen. What you need is an integrated framework that I showed you before that allows you to integrate all the disciplines from business analysis and enterprise architecture and business architecture and UX and UI designers, along with your agile project team, who will come in at the right time to deliver the right solution faster. Break down functional silos. So again, an organization charts, unfortunately, have taught us how to work very well within our teams, but not across our teams. So again, reward people who actually step outside their teams and want to work more broadly with other people in order to solve problems more effectively in your organization. Get rid of disciplined bigots. So in a lot of organizations I've come across where they believe that the project managers and the project management office are the people that run everything and everything has to be done according to the project management method or framework that you're using. So, and it's the same thing enterprise architects think in their ivory tower that everybody has to do things their way because they're the ones who are best at aligning strategy and outcomes. So again, that makes us fall into the trap of being disciplined bigots. So if we set aside our bigotry and learn how to harness the best of every discipline that we encounter through our problem solving and solutioning phases, we will deliver much better outcomes. A lot of organizations today are investing in digital transformation strategies but the challenge is that they're only thinking about delivering technology solutions. I want you to take away today that digital transformations, <coughs> excuse me, are not about technology, it's about people and transforming the way people work so that they take away great experiences when they use our technology solutions. So don't promote people in IT because they're really good technologists. Promote people in IT because they are good problem solvers and team players and think of themselves as being part of the business, not just from IT. So stop thinking that by investing in IT solutions, I'm giving you the answers. Take more time to think about what's the problem that you're trying to solve first and you will find that you very likely give the business what they really need rather than what they want. Embrace these things. So value change enablement, um, I've spoken about it as uh, before. So if you want to really realize the benefits of your investments <coughs> and your benefits in change, then ensure that you're investing in people will understand how to help customers and employees change. Reward and recognize people for working outside their comfort zones. So true innovation and organization is going to come because people recognize that they need to solve problems differently. 
not just bringing out the shiny new toolkit uh, that's available on the market, but solving business problems in unique ways that integrates your customer journeys with the way the organization is designed to give that innovation back to the industry. Embed business agility across the organization. So this comes back to don't think agile is your silver bullet or the safe method is your silver bullet. What the business needs us to do is to find ways to be adaptive and responsive to the changes that are happening in their industry. And this means being able to model how to be adaptive and responsible now becomes really important and critical, critical to deliver business agility. Overhaul your demand management process. And I challenge you to look at your pipeline to have a look at what's in your portfolio that is actually focused on solving business problems and what is just a laundry list of somebody wanting to change the way a system works today. So coming up to the last bit of my presentation, some pitfalls to look out, look out for as you're going down this journey of working as a multidisciplinary team in your architecture practice. So avoid these things. Avoid investing only in UX and UI um, and think that you are the masters of experience management. So I'm going to tell you that a lot of projects that are only doing UX and UI changes to their solutions today are merely putting lipstick on a pig. It looks great, but overall, it's not going to make a difference to delivering an outcome faster, better, at a lower cost. So again, the challenge is when you invest in UX and UI, if you're improving experience design, you're only fixing part of the problem. If you're investing in experience design, you're improving just the front stage. You haven't done anything about improving things that are happening on the backstage. So user interface design is when you're putting lipstick on that beautiful little pig. And service design, however, when you start investing in this, this is when you make start to make the right changes. Because when you have looked at the end-to-end -end customer journey and, and the experience at all the stages and how the backstage is contributing to that end-to-end -end experience is where you really want to be. So pitfall number two, avoid investing in only agile methods such as SAFE. So what you really need in your organization is what we call integrated governance, where this breaks down your silos within your organization and has teams working together. So everybody understands that we're here to collaborate and work with the business and partnership so that we are aligned right from strategic planning through to change in, uh, enablement because this is where we're truly embedding the change that the organization needs to achieve its strategic objectives. So pitfall number three, avoid making just technology and process improvements. That's not a digital transformation. So when we look at what's involved in a capability, which is on our backstage, we know in IT, we're really good at changing out the technology, bringing in something new. We don't really do much with the data or the data quality, and we might improve a process through automation. But we forget about helping people now learn how to work in the new environment. So when we haven't taught people how to use their new tools effectively, we end up with really poor customer experiences on the right-hand side. So remember when you are making changes in your organization and if you want to be truly digital and disruptive, start with the people in your organization and do your customer research and your end user research to understand how they work and why they work and what do they use to work because they're the things you need to focus on improving as they become your levers for change 
in processes, data quality and technology as well. And that's pretty much it. So I hope you've taken some key points uh, and pointers away from the session today. So we started off by looking at um, what the definitions of service design and business architecture were, because they're really what are, what's going to help you achieve integration between the journeys that your customers take and how your organization is set up and designed to deliver the wows on that journey. We then looked at what are the types of things that you typically would model on a front stage. We looked at customer journey maps, service blueprints, personas. There are quite a few models out there as well. My go-to page, uh, web page, to get more ideas of what should I model or what could I model, um, I go to the IDEO uh, toolkit as well. Um, we then looked at what was on the backstage. So most business architects and enterprise architects will be familiar with the models I spoke about today. So go and have a look at your capability models, your organization charts, your process flow models, and work out how do I actually integrate these models so that it gives me that complete comprehensive end-to-end -end picture of what does my customer journey truly look like. And that's when you'll achieve integrating your front end with your back end. We then looked at some things that you should do uh, in order to build a multidisciplinary capability within your organization. And then we looked at some pitfalls and things to look out for and avoid on your journey to becoming great architects.